but please do um, you know go ahead and kind of uh, write whatever you want to ask any anything you want from the panelists. So we're going to move on now to uh, Dr. Maura Conway, who I'm sure will need no introduction for many of you, but in case you don't know her, she's a Professor of International Security at ECU in Dublin and coordinator of VoxPol, uh, which is the EU funded project on violent online political extremism. Um, her main research interests are in the area of terrorism and the internet, and she's been working in this field for at least as long as I remember, which is a couple of decades or so. Um, so I hope that doesn't make you feel, oh, sorry, sorry, Maura. Uh, anyway, um, over to you, Maura. Thanks very much. That was a shh. <laughs> I'll say that. Um, thanks, Peter. Um, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's good to be here. Um, I, I want to talk about, um, uh, I guess, ethics broadly in online extremism and terrorism research. And as has been observed to me more than once, I do like a list. So I want to talk about five things uh, very briefly, uh, if I might. I guess the first thing that I, I want to say is that um, I, I think that is something very positive is, is plainly happening in extremism and terrorism uh, studies, which is that um, finally now we're beginning to talk about uh, ethics issues. Uh, and I think that's a very positive thing. And, and for anybody who's particularly interested in the area, um, I, I, um, I, I very much uh, point you to the current uh, issue of terrorism and political violence, which is precisely about um, terrorism ethics. And I think there's a lot of uh, very interesting articles in there, a diversity of views uh, and whatnot, and, and all of them uh, useful. Uh, in, in that um, special issue, I have an article uh, about specifically uh, online, and, and that's what uh, I wanted to speak to a little bit uh, this evening. And, um, you know, I, I, I think that it's very positive um, uh, that we are now paying closer attention uh, to research or welfare uh, issues, uh, especially amongst online extremism and terrorism uh, researchers. Um, but at the same time, uh, I don't think that this is the, the only important issue, if you like, uh, plainly, uh, if we are thinking about ethics. Uh, in online extremism and terrorism research, uh, because there's a whole panoply of other issues um, that are also not being sufficiently addressed. So while, while obviously, and, and in my own TPV article, a large portion of it is about um, research or welfare issues, uh, what I wanted to point to a little bit more this evening, because I know other colleagues on the panel are, are going to um, get into the research or welfare issue, is, is point up some other things that I think are uh, important. Uh, and, and this is certainly not um, uh, exhaustive, and it really does, I don't have a lot of answers. These, these are more sort of questions and issue areas and things that we need to um, think more about. So the, the first thing for me, certainly, is about learning from others. And I don't think we've been great uh, in our particular space. So I don't think we as online extremism and terrorism researchers have been great in terms of, of learning from others uh, over time. And in particular, uh, and, and I've written about this previously, there is um, uh, another discipline or sub-discipline, if you like, called internet research where actually people have been talking about ethics issues, specifically online uh, research ethics, uh, for 20 plus years, more uh, uh, even if, if you care to delve into it. Uh, and, and so um, uh, the Association of Internet Researchers have some very well-regarded guidelines that I don't think are yet as well known in our field uh, as they ought to be. But they're not the only ones uh, out there. For example, uh, the British Psychological Association has online research ethics guidelines. The Norwegian Research Council uh, uh, has some guidelines and, and there are uh, others. My point here, I think, is to say that we, we're not starting from scratch. We don't need uh, to start from scratch, that there are others um, who have been grappling uh, with these issues for some time. And this is true also, uh, actually, of other disciplines. It's not just internet studies, because there is useful work that's been done on um, ethical issues uh, amongst researchers who, who also deal with um, 
you know, uh, communities uh, that, that um, are, are um, what's the right word, I guess, here, that, that, that um, other types of research that's difficult, if you like. So there, there's good work on, on research ethics and indeed welfare issues. Most researchers um, who study sex offenders, uh, domestic violence, um, if we're looking at uh, online again, uh, dark web markets, drug markets, uh, uh, and this kind of thing. So it's an across the board, I guess, uh, sort of um, uh, a call for us to, to take a more across the board look at things uh, and learn um, from, from others who've already trodden some quite similar uh, paths and to build on that work. That's number one. Um, number two, I think we need to pay a lot more attention to legal and jurisdictional uh, issues. Uh, and, and, and the thing that often strikes me is the very significant differences between uh, the, the, the legal situation in, for example, the UK uh, versus, for example, the United States. And I think a lot of the time uh, there's not sufficient awareness about uh, quite how great a gulf um, there is. Um, between these two jurisdictions, because quite a lot of the time, I think we feel like um, we're talking about, you know, liberal Western democratic co uh, countries, we're all on the same page, right? Um, but it turns out not so much um, in, in large part, and there's very different restrictions in ter related to speech, and thereby also, you know, the kind of requirements that you're looking at in terms of um, research ethics requirements, particularly in academic institutions between, on the one hand, the United States and, on the other hand, UK uh, institutions. Uh, and people uh, in the UK, I do think, should pay a bit closer attention to the Terrorism uh, Act uh, and, and various of the things they have to say or not say um, ab about doing research on um, extremist and terrorist uh, content specifically. One of the things I think the EU does is it equates ethics with GDPR. I obviously think that's mistaken, but nonetheless, the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, uh, is, is crucially important uh, in this space uh, also. And again, in a European uh, context, there are quite significant uh, re requirements there uh, also in relation to data collection, in relation to data storage, in relation to purging data, for example, so how long it can be held for uh, and uh, what have you. There's, I, I won't get into it here, but I think we could have a very interesting discussion about platforms, terms of service, uh, and where they fit. Uh, in, in this uh, discussion. There is some interesting work that's been done by internet researchers precisely uh, about this issue and where it fits into uh, ethics uh, discussions. Uh, Anne uh, talked a little bit about uh, reporting obligations and that's something else that I think uh, hasn't received sufficient attention uh, in, our, uh, in our field uh, to date. Let me talk a little bit, uh, perhaps uh, finally, uh, because I'm running out of time more than anything else, uh, about uh, publication and knowledge communication ethics. Uh, and this is another area that I think uh, uh, warrants attention uh, to. Um, in particular, I guess I would say that increasingly there is um, pressure on academics and other researchers, and uh, not just to publish, but also to publicize. Uh, and I think that it's worth thinking through uh, some of these issues and what are the ethical issues um, that, are, that arise um, out of this. I think there's also questions around uh, visuals uh, and their communication. Um, not so much, I think, in quite narrowly focused academic publications, but again, when we're coming back to um, publicizing this research, uh, for example, uh, in, in uh, more mainstream uh, fora, uh, or, or indeed circulating uh, content on social media, uh, media uh, and uh, what have you. So if I was going to sum up, I guess what I think I would say is this. Um, I, I absolutely um, uh, feel like that we can do uh, more, that there's an interesting conversation that started, but we can certainly do more thinking about the research or welfare issue, but that ethics in our subfield does not just equal 
research or welfare, and we need to think about a broad array um, of other issues. We definitely need to learn from others. There's no need to reinvent, wholly reinvent uh, the wheel. Um, I think all of this will be useful, this, this now ongoing conversation for negotiating with research ethics committees uh, or IRBs, um, which is, um, I think, something that is uh, becoming um, a more and more of an issue uh, in our uh, area. Um, I, I think gatherings like this and other events are absolutely crucial because, uh, like I say, a, a lot of this now is about raising questions and we need to progress things and, and begin to, I think, come to um, some sort of consensus, if we can, or, or at least some kind of, um, you, you know, um, a consensus may, may not in fact be, you know, um, achievable, but, um, you know, where, where we begin to progress things further um, at the very least. And so for me, finally, I think one of the most important things, in fact, uh, is, is for us to write down uh, s s some of these things and discuss them in writing. Um, and I know that that can be tricky because some of these are tricky issues, but nonetheless, um, I think that would be something absolutely concrete that if we started to do and did more sort of case studies of ethics issues and dilemmas and whatnot, and built up a sort of archive, if you like, that that could have really massive utility uh, in this field. Thanks. Thanks very much, Maura. That was great. It was really good to kind of have a broad overview of all of that. Um, and you set out the issues really well there. I'm gonna, we're going to move on now to uh, Dr. Alexis Henshaw, uh, who is an assistant professor at Troy University in Alabama. Um, her research interests include gender issues in international politics, civil wars, and conflict management. And she's the author of an excellent book on women's participation in armed rebel groups uh, titled Why Women Rebel. So Alexis, over to you. Great, thank you so much. So let me see if I can get my slides to come up here. Okay. So I thought that my contribution to this panel could be perhaps talking a little bit about uh, adopting a feminist ethic for digital research. Um, if you're more interested in some of the background on this, some of this comes out of a report that I authored for GNET, which came out in March of this year about uh, bringing women, peace and security online and mainstreaming gender in responses to online extremism. So that's available now uh, for anyone who's interested in downloading it. But um, thinking about a few principles that I could discuss in the time allotted, um, a couple of, of things to keep in mind, um, you know, with regard to feminist research, we tend to think, you know, first and foremost about the ethics of highlighting and improving the lived experience of women. So the notion of a feminist security studies really comes from trying to stand in opposition to uh, more ideas of a, a value neutral social science in the sense that there's a normative commitment um, to improving the lived experience. And in some ways, this is also meant to be a corrective to years of research in the field that has really been centered on the uh, experience of men. So for example, in the context of GNET, I think we've had some really important discussions through the insights and through events like this over the past year and a half to discussing, uh, for example, the need to see uh, extremist misogyny as a form of extremism as well that translates to real world violence for a lot of women. Um, related to that, we also see this need to uh, understand the interconnected nature of hierarchies, including not only gender, but um, identification with LGBTQ communities, race, ethnicity, things like that. So we've seen some really important research come out over the past few years about the distinct uh, experiences that, you know, for example, women of color or members of the LGBT community face when they are active online, either as researchers, as activists or so forth. Um, and I can share some of that on my social media after this uh, meeting is done. Um, but also, you know, uh, as I think uh, we heard 
in the last presentation, the need to uh, think about privacy and personal security is also something that is really pushing the boundaries of, of ethics for many of us. Um, so there's long been an ethic in feminist research of you know, paying attention to researcher positionality and the power relationships between researchers and individuals being studied. Certainly, we need to reconceptualize, I think, some of our uh, understandings of, of risk and reasonable expectation of privacy in an age where people might be, for example, interviewing research subjects over Zoom, using cloud computing platforms. Um, but also, you know, there's uh, a, an issue of, you know, personal security and privacy that comes into this as well, as we heard, uh, you know, just in the past presentation. And as I think we'll hear coming up that, you know, for the past year and a half or so, most of us have been living in an environment where the boundaries between the personal and the professional have become incredibly blurred. Um, we're bringing colleagues into our home and in, in, to some extent. And when we're doing events like this, um, you know, we're, we're in some cases, maybe using our home internet connections to, to do some of this research. Um, but especially for early career researchers, I think we need to think about what some of the risks of that are. Um, it's become very normalized to give us the recommendation uh, as early career researchers to have a website, have public social media profiles, be very active in these conversations in a way that can be potentially weaponized um, and that we've seen used against researchers in various recent cases. Um, there's also the need to engage a diversity of stakeholders in some of the research we're doing. So certainly at the international level, I think it's it's there's been an attempt to really create norms surrounding the need to include grassroots organizations, civil society organizations, and activists in the work of gender and security. Um, at the international level, this was really seen as a safeguard against abusive actions by state governments. Um, we do know that states can also be responsible for gendered harms online, like uh, coordinated attacks against female journalists. Um, but there's also a need to expand some of those accountability frameworks to, to cover the responsibility Abilities of private actors as well um, and to hold them responsible for some of those things. Also, as we heard a minute ago, I think that uh, engaging a diversity of stakeholders also really speaks to the issue of interdisciplinarity, which is that, you know, rather than having different disciplinary silos in which we're doing research on things like gender and security, there needs to be maybe more dialogue between what social scientists are doing, what internet researchers are doing, uh, what may be happening in the field of human computer interactions, which often tend to emerge separately uh, and not always to have a, a neat synergy with one another. Respecting the labor of data production, I think, is also an important contribution that feminist research can make. So it's been about 20 years since Spike Peterson wrote on the coming importance of the virtual economy and the potential for commodification of our data and for the, the creation and perpetuation of social hierarchies uh, based on data collection, which has turned out to be quite prescient. So I think as researchers, we need to reflect on the degree to which the data that we use, whether it's social media posts, databases of images, so forth is the product of labor that may be unwittingly provided and or unreimbursed for people involved. I think there also needs to be some ethical reflection on the use of effectively uh, gig labor practices for data generation. So things like uh, hiring people to fill out online surveys and things like that. Um, and then the final point that I wanted to kind of reflect upon is the need to center human knowledge and experience. So I think we are coming to the point, especially in social sciences, where we should problematize applications of artificial intelligence in research and in security practice. Um, there has certainly been some uh, excellent research out there by women of color, including Gebru and Bulamwini about uh, things like algorithmic bias. Um, similarly, there's been a, a move within a lot of academic research in the social sciences to promote more transparency. So whereas it's it's been the norm for a while that those of us doing quantitative social science research should share our data and replication files. There's been a push more recently for qualitative researchers as well to make use of repositories and pre-registration. So we also need to think about what sorts of 
ethical guidelines and transparency guidelines should be applied to computational social science research in the future. So all of these, I think, are, are topics that, you know, could be further for discussion and reflection. And it sounds like some of the other panelists will discuss more of this coming up. Um, but again, you know, if you're interested, I'll, I'll share some research uh, and resources on this. In the interest of time, I'll, I'll share it on my social media as well. But um, again, you know, thank you so much and, and looking forward to hearing from the other panelists. Great, Thank, thanks so much, uh, Alexis. That was really interesting. Uh, yeah, one, your point there about kind of staying safe in terms of like your online presence is another aspect of all this, which kind of really interests me at the moment as well. Um, so we're gonna move on now to uh, Dr. Michael Croner, who is Senior Researcher and Assistant Professor in Media and Communication Studies at Malmö University in Sweden. Um, he's been working on Islamic State propaganda since uh, 2014, I think, and monitors IS channels on encrypted platforms. And you'll probably be familiar with his insightful Twitter feed. Um, so over to you, Michael. Thank you, Peter. Uh, let me just put up my there, my uh, slide. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, good evening, everybody who's listening. Um, and thank you for the kind words about my Twitter feed. Uh, <laughs> I um, will focus this presentation on, on the ethical side rather than the uh, safety side, even if they are closely linked. Um, for those who don't know, I've been studying um, Islamic State online for seven years. Uh, and uh, the primary method for this is um, infiltrating uh, channels on, at least during the last four or five years on encrypted uh, channels. And I think it's useful sometimes, not just for, for um, myself as a researcher, but also for fellow researchers or those who are interested to, to, to stay and reflect on some experiences especially when it comes to the, the ethical part. Uh, I think the, my sort of um, trajectory or, or journey through seven years of, of monitoring and infiltrating channels uh, has really um, uh, challenged me from, from an ethical point of view. And um, I think the, there are always different uh, questions that arise as, as a researcher um, especially when it comes to this type of, of content. And some of the questions that I've um, come across or had to ask myself in this line of work um, has to do with how I approach uh, different online communities for collecting data. How do I produce ethically viable results uh, when individuals are behind accounts? Uh, how do I communicate about my research publicly and in an ethically responsible way? And then from a safety perspective, how do I protect myself in terms of being detected um, uh, by the, the individuals that I'm studying? How do I protect my mental well-being from, from uh, sort of damage of repeated exposure of violence? Uh, and also how do I protect myself from physical threats and risk? And all these questions, um, I wouldn't say I've found the answers to them. Uh, and um, but, but it's something that is, is, is um, always there um, and very present in, in everyday work. Uh, for this presentation, I wanna focus on the first question, which is the methodological approach, uh, not least concerning encrypted spaces or platforms, uh, as we heard in earlier presentations, also the platforms where Islamic State supporters are, are active on are, are very many. Uh, and the majority of them these days are closed in some sense or, or protected by encryption, um, which has posed several uh, challenges. So I just wanted to show here my brief overview of different tactics that I've used over the years and, and, and still are using. Um, in the beginning of the, if we stick to the Islamic State, the, the caliphate years in 2014, a lot of the channels were open which meant that I could observe open channels and we didn't really affect the data um, uh, and it wasn't really ethically problematic. Of course, there's always an aspect of ethics in, in science, but 
in comparison to others, it, it really wasn't. And then when you come more into the um, encrypted channels, requesting access to, to channels through these invite links, requesting access through um, a secret chat or one-to-one -one communication with the administrator of channels. Uh, sometimes I come across vetting processes with administrators of channels where I get questioned about my beliefs and who I am and everything. And then I have the passive observation uh, using my real name, meaning that I'm open with my uh, purpose uh, and research. Passive observation with alias. Um, uh, and then I have the interacting with participants with real name or interacting with participants with alias. And these are different uh, tactics and approaches that I, I'm quite sure that the majority of my fellow researchers also uh, work um, through when monitoring these channels. Um, from an ethical standpoint, I, I just took notes here to the right about what I feel can be problematic and not. And um, I think there is a good analogy to be made as a, as a traffic light system. So I, I decided to just show what I consider the least problematic and the most problematic, green being the least problematic and, and red being the most problematic. Um, uh, the observing open channels um, and the passive observation with near real name sort of complies with standard ethical guidelines in my view. Um, but I am open with, with uh, my purpose and my research. Um, and I do not sort of access uh, content uh, that could be ethically uh, problematic, but it's uh, open on, on social media platforms and, and we can study them as, as texts, uh, et cetera. So, and then the yellow ones, uh, which are sort of in the middle, um, somewhat problematic, uh, and the red one where it comes to direct interaction with some of the uh, individuals I've tried to stay away from. So looking at the, the green ones, which should be the, the obvious uh, sort of choice, is not as, as obvious as it seems. Um, open channel since 2016 has become very much less valuable. Majority of the activity occur these days in closed settings uh, or encrypted channels. Uh, passive observation with my real name, I realized quite quickly a few years ago that it has a very high safety risk uh, for the researcher, um, which also using alias have, but it, it become just very evident for me um, uh, through, throughout the years that that really doesn't work uh, if I want to study encrypted uh, platforms, um, which means that the yellow ones are more or less what I'm sort of landed in and, and doing when it comes to um, encrypted channels. Uh, requesting an access through invite links. And as you know, you can come across invite links in, in different ways and on different platforms. Um, I choose, of course, to hide my identity uh, and I don't alert about my, my um, uh, presence there. I don't deceive actively. I don't lie uh, about who I am. I just stay quiet, basically, which is, yeah, it's a, a semantic about lying, but but I, I think you know what I mean. Um, the passive observation using an alias, um, I think it's become more and more uh, evident for me that at least in the last two or three years that the individuals that I study in these channels and groups are more aware that they might be monitored all the time. So that also sort of changes their behavior. But I still feel that the, the, the passive observation using an alias with the ethical uh, problematic areas that sort of entail is still the, the best method for, for doing this type of research. And I think the questions that still I still grapple with and, and still try to um, uh, sort of come to some agreement with or try to understand, is it possible at all to obtain raw and untainted data when we monitor encrypted and extremist channels without crossing any ethical boundaries? I'm not sure it is. Uh, I'm sure we will discuss this during the Q&A uh, &A later. Uh, the knowledge about online group dynamics uh, through monitoring in real time, um, is it more important than the ethical principles of informed consent and transparency? 
The obvious answer would be no, because the ethical sort of guidelines separates us from other professions. So it's, um, but it's still something worth uh, considering, not least because I, as a researcher, has always felt a, I've been very convinced of the importance of observing things live rather than archiving all content and conversations and looking at it afterwards. Because I think there is a dynamic there that is really interesting. Uh, and then also the, the last part, can my safety as a researcher ever be used as a justifying argument uh, for conducting covert uh, research via alias? Uh, it's, it's, it's really tricky questions. Uh, I wouldn't post them here if I had the answers, of course, but it, it is something that, that really is um, present in, in my work. And I use the analogy of a traffic light system because I feel that if, if the green ones, they, they don't really work and the red ones are, are really something that I try to stay away from or trying to provoke uh, results or interacting, I think we are uh, to a large extent at the red, uh, sort of the uh, yellow light where we are ready to go, but we can't really uh, go yet because what we need is a more proper ethical sort of system, uh, guidelines and system that is more tailored to terrorism research. And I think it's something that I look forward to discussing with my, my fellow um, speakers here. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Peter. I'll stay there. Thanks very much, Michael. Yeah, those are certainly all kind of questions that I've had to grapple with over the years as well. So completely sympathize with all of that. And I don't, I'm not sure I have the answers myself on all of that. Um, so uh, final panelist we're going to move on to now is uh, Meili Kriesis, who is a program associate at the Polarization and Extremism, Extremism Research and Innovation Laboratory, um, acronym PERIL at the American University in Washington, DC. And um, Meili has worked on violent extremism across various ideologies spanning both uh, Islamic State propaganda and uh, white supremacists online, which gives her a great vantage point uh, for you know, discussing the issue of research safety and ethics. So Meili, over to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation to be on the panel, and it's a pleasure being here with you all. Uh, so yes, uh, a lot of great topics have been covered. So I think I would like to focus on uh, discussions with new researchers who, who are coming into the field. Uh, and and I'm, right now I'm thinking uh, of, of conversations with fellow peril colleagues who are starting to look more into the online spaces and uh, as other panelists have discussed, you know, they need to take in consideration questions about personal safety, ethics, data collection. Uh, so I guess in terms of, of possible guidelines and how to go about this conversation, I think it would be important to promote conversations like this uh, and then provide, uh, I guess, alleyways, right, for new researchers to get plugged in with, with others who have been doing this work for a while and then connect and have you know really organic non-pressure informal conversations about how do you stay safe online uh you know what are questions that might come up in your mind of you know including questions that I've, I've thought of too when i started looking online like is it okay to use an alias and you know have passive observation as dr corona had uh, shared in his slide, uh, is that ethical? And you know, is it okay if I just click on links and then also that feels like the best and safest way to protect myself? Uh, so I'll start off by by listing some questions, maybe that that um, might help guide people in in terms of. I mean, are they even you know, ready to do this? Do they want to do this? Because there are definitely other aspects of terrorism research that don't involve this kind of heavy online monitoring. But if someone feels like they are interested in doing it, I think maybe before they jump in, it's probably really good to talk to people who have been doing this, but also ask them, sit down and you know, ask themselves, a series of questions, you know, such as, and I'm just talking off the top of my head, but such as, do I understand that there are inherent risks that come with focusing on these subject matters? And am I willing to accept this? Uh, how can I be proactive in reducing risk before going online? Like, am I familiar with, with um, safety protocol that can best protect me and uh, also hide my, my IP location, for example? Uh, and then um, there are other considerations, like it's almost certain that I'll encounter disturbing content. What resources can I consult regarding viewing this violence and disturbing content? And do I have a support network that I can discuss these things with? Um, and then also how best can I 
protect the data and research subjects. So especially if you're doing interviews online, uh, you know, and you want to make a uh, guarantee that anonymity and not put the individual at risk to to protect the um, the, re the research subject, how can you lock down that data and, uh, you know, avoid it getting hacked by by anyone pretty much. Uh, and how do you store that safely. Uh, and then there are other questions too about, you know, personal identity first, especially for for researchers who are women or members of minority groups or, or both, um, as Dr. Henshaw had discussed earlier. Uh, so, you know, how do you, you take your in your positionality as a researcher and how it affects uh, the way you interact online, the way you perceive things, um, the way that maybe disturbing content can harm you, especially if it's about your own group, about like women, all the misogyny that you see online, or if you're Muslim, for example, and a lot of the, um, the far right white supremacist groups, you'll see a lot of, of course, anti-Muslim and also anti-Semitic content, like how will that affect you personally? So I think uh, maybe some just posing some ideas out there is that I think it'd be great to have opportunities for, for researchers to connect with one another and share online safety tips, share guidance, uh, and then also experiences just to have a kind of like a, almost like a therapeutic means of, of discussion. Um, and then also I think the trainings, maybe more formal trainings on, for example, how to use Telegram could be really uh, proactive in preventing any mistakes being made on the part of a new researcher because those kinds of mistakes, they, they actually can be quite serious. I have heard of cases where if people you know someone has not been careful enough and then uh, for example Islamic State found their location so it can have very serious consequences and for people who are new to a platform it may seem like oh if I know how to use Facebook if I'm tech savvy then I should be good on this encrypted app app of X Y or Z but in all honesty if you do miss one detail it can leave you open to uh, being found out basically by these extremists online which you really don't want obviously so it might be very helpful to even have that that walkthrough and uh, maybe even the creation within um, organizations like internal guides that you can share with fellow colleagues and associates and you know just make sure everyone's being careful. Uh, and then I think the there's a point I'd like to make about online conduct. So some of the propaganda is kind of funny, especially the grassroots uh, propaganda that comes out. It's a bit corny, you know, really weird fonts, really weird spellings. And it's fun to laugh at. And then sometimes you see, you know, posters that that list, uh, you know, con this is how you get in contact with the group. So unfortunately, I have seen sometimes on Twitter that maybe without censoring it properly, people are sharing. Uh, sometimes people have shared uh, like un completely unedited, unredacted uh, screenshots of some of this content, which can be really harmful, especially when you're not uh, blurring out the, the contact information for, for example, Islamic State supporter networks. So I think there's a thing to take in consideration in terms of, you know, it's okay to share content and, and screenshots. It's really helpful and educational. But uh, in the case of, I guess, you know, minimum cases, but I've seen it, you know, not redacting that type of information of like the email, like I've seen emails hanging out there, also links are, are showing. So just being super conscientious of at least redacting that information before proceeding and, and sharing that more widely online. So that might go more along the lines of ethical uh, research. And let's see, I think um, the last point is, is thinking about how on, online um, settings affect IRBs and in terms of, of how to abide by the IRB guidelines, but also think about, well, what, what levels of deception are acceptable for the IRB? And then uh, maybe gathering with the IRB board and thinking about how the, how the online um, uh, network can, can add these really interesting ambiguities that you might not encounter if you're doing field research in person, for example. So yeah, I think that's it for me. And uh, thank, thank you again. Thank you so much, Mary. That's great. Uh, like lots of food for thought there. Um, so we're going to go on to like feel, have some questions now, which will start coming in. Um, we but do do ask anything else uh, that you want to ask in there. Just before we start the questions, we've got one um, we've got one comment really from Nyanka uh, uh, at uh, the GIF CT. Um, which is just a kind of resource, really. Um, I don't know if everyone can see, I'm not sure if anyone can, everyone can see the questions in the Q&A, uh, but if you can't, uh, there's like, uh, Nyanka says, uh, may be helpful to share the GIFCT uh, member resource guide, which has links to all the tech member companies, safety and security centers. So that's Facebook, uh, Twitter, Microsoft, and and Google. And the URL, in case you can't see it, is gifct.org forward slash resource hyphen guide. Uh, so that's that's that. Um, we're going to start off with a, a, a 
a kind of a quick and easy question. A couple of questions actually for Anna. Um, uh, first of all, one from Lena, um, who asked, which languages do you work with? And then another one, which uh, is asking, can the TCAP be used for police investigations to help know where to pursue interaction with online extremists? Um, yeah, thanks, Peter, and thanks, thanks for those questions. So, um, first on the on the language point, so we um, in, look ingest material and alert material in different languages. So, um, Arabic, Russian, German, uh, English, French, kind of like if it is assessed as an official piece of content or an official terrorist material, then if it is a direct translation of that, we include that material in the TCAP. Um, and also, I think with languages also comes uh, another point, which is kind of like a diversity point and. Um, for that, it's really that because we are, you know, incorporating material um, from from around the world in terms of terrorist groups being, being present around the world. Um, our academic advisory board is really meant for us to include academics from from a diverse background. Um, so to make sure that we that we have, um, you know, representatives from different sectors um, and and different uh, countries and different di diversity backgrounds. So that's really important to our mission. Um, in terms of the police investigation, so the answer is no. So governments don't have access to the TCAP. Um, it is sponsored by the government of Canada, but even they don't have access. And this is really, um, it was also sort of a requirement from the from the government of Canada, but it's also to make sure that we are, you know, it's a political topic and we now follow designation lists by several countries and kind of ground it in the rule of law. And if we maybe base it on one particular government's wishes and sort of give them access, um, then a whole range of like politicized questions get opened up. Um, so therefore, we're, we're not doing that. But again, as I said, we have a threat to life protocol and any information that is a threat to life, we do alert to the relevant authorities, not just the UK police. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Thanks very much, Anna. Um, yeah, I've got a question now from Jacqueline Lacroix, who's asking um, quite an interesting question. So the discussions today were focused on ethics for academic researchers, but she's asking in terms of data collection, in, and research in the private sector with the aim of countering or preventing violence and extremism. Do you think that the same ethics considerations should be included in this work? So any thoughts on that would be great for many of you. Yeah, um, so I think, it's a, I think this is a really interesting question. And I think that, um, you know, it, it's interesting when we begin to think about other sectors and but plainly, so academics um, are working within institutions and all major academic institutions in the Western world have ethical requirements on their uh, researchers. So, okay, so then the people closest to us, I guess, probably are those working in think tanks. And definitely some think tanks who are active in this particular area have begun certainly to think about ethics issues and to uh, operationalize ethics um, within their, um, uh, within their um, area uh, also. Um, there's some uh, companies um, who are in the CVE space. Um, Moonshot, for example, has been quite open about um, they're um, thinking through ethics issues uh, and whatnot. But then it's interesting too, I think, to think about um, others um, and wh where they stand. For example, um, journalists um, have different interests, if you like, and also different um, ethical requirements to academics. Um, though um, I do think there's an interesting discussion we could have about going back to um, what I was saying about, you know, uh, us increasingly publicizing our work and therefore coming into contact with journalism and maybe even some work in this area beginning to look journalistic in nature. And that does definitely throw up ethical issues because there's very different ethical requirements in academics versus journalists. There's also very different legal requirements on, et on academics versus journalists. But then there's people in tech companies um, there's people um, who are uh, uh, in police uh, units. Um, so there's, you, you can begin to see quite a lot of different actors. Uh, we are doing on the face of it the same thing, um, but oftentimes our interests are different and thereby also the ethical requirements that are placed on us um, are different. Um, so um, that's an area I think that maybe we could fruitfully think about a bit more, actually. 
Any other um, points from any of the rest of the panelists on that question? Yeah, I'd say this is, you know, partly what I think I was trying to speak to as well when I was thinking about diversity of stakeholders is that, uh, you know, I mean, we, we've created these kind of frameworks, especially in the realm of gender and security that are really meant to hold state actors and international actors accountable, you know, and we happen to be creating these frameworks exactly at a time that these other, you know, sorts of actors over here, right, are, are coming into the space um, that are not necessarily accountable under those same frameworks. The other thing is that, um, you know, when I, I talked a little bit about the, you know, targeting uh, of women uh, academics uh, and journalists and public figures online, which is a really serious issue. Um, and a lot of the work, research that's been done on that has actually uh, been focused on um, risks faced by female journalists. So, one of the resources that I'll, I'll share um, on my social media if anyone wants to look it up is uh, a report that came out earlier this year called Malign Creativity um, by Nina Jankowitz and, and co-authors. And, you know, they specifically interviewed uh, female journalists and women of color journalists who had been targeted by, you know, organized extremist misogyny basically on, online. And um, I think those are really powerful stories to consider as well when we're thinking about, you know, personal ethics and safety online. Yeah, Maura, do you have your hand up? Do you got another point? Yeah. Yeah, sorry, just, just to come back and say when we're talking about resources. Um, so on the Voxpal website, uh, there is a whole page uh, that's called Researcher Resources with a whole bunch of sub um, pages. Um, there's a bunch of stuff about ethics issues. There's a bunch of stuff about researcher welfare uh, issues. And a lot of it is quite kind of, uh, it's, it's quite practical. Um, a, lo a lot of it too. So I guess people who are interested and, and looking for some kind of place to start, um, it might be a good place to start. The other thing I wanted to say was, yeah, so um, Alexis was just talking about um, exactly great work done out of journalism and um, researchers who research on journalists and um, uh, especially about female journalists and, and, and um, activity against them online. Um, we actually have a report coming out also where we talked to approximately 40 colleagues in this particular research space, online extremism and terrorism, um, about um, their experiences and research or welfare issues and what have you. And one of the things that Miley said earlier was that, you know, sometimes it's just good to, good to talk. And almost everybody said to us when we were doing these interviews, you know, it was great to talk to somebody um, about this and wanna, and we want to get our report out there because we also think that just for others, just reading it and realizing that other people have these very same experiences would be a positive thing, you know. So, uh, yeah, that, that was a, a large part of our purpose with that, per, that, those, that particular series of interviews and that research. Yeah. Um, just uh, so, so I've got another question here for Maura. Um, which kind of follows up on, you may have well or already answered it in, in your previous kind of intervention. Um, it's asking, can you speak to the question of secondary psychological effects on researchers which may arise, arise from conducting research in the field of online uh, extremism, terrorism? They're asking specifically if you can refer to specific articles on this matter. So I suppose you've, you've um, just kind of directed to some good resources there. Yeah, exactly. So definitely uh, the person who asked the question and anyone else who's interested, there's a bunch of links uh, on, on the Voxpal researcher uh, resources pages. That's one thing. Um, keep an eye out for our Reassure project report um, because that also goes to it. And I do talk about researcher uh, welfare issues uh, in uh, my terrorism and political violence article that's in the, the present uh, special issue. And I think anybody who's interested could usefully take a look um, at the special issue broadly, if you're interested in ethics and terrorism broadly, and, and at my particular paper, if you want to take a look, um, because I, I, I made an effort to cite uh, as much as I could, you know, um, so, so people could go and, and, and track down um, additional literature. Always good to look at the footnotes. Yeah. Um, no, a question now for, for Maylee. Um, it's from Bell Riley Thompson, um, who's asking, um, there, there are new researcher here focusing on QAnon in Canada. And what would be your most pertinent piece of advice to a newbie like uh, herself uh, 
who passively uses Telegram to uh, research and report on these um, subjects in general. So what's your best piece of advice to it? Uh, you know, an early career researcher or your cat's uh, advice. My, my cat's trying to answer the question. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank you for thank you for the question. So what I'll say is, I think it depends on what you're comfortable with. So if you're going in using your real name, your real identity and being open that you are a researcher, you should, you know, always be careful, like don't put your phone number out there, make sure it's not viewable on telegram settings. But I'll say if you would rather do the option of um, creating a pseudonym and then observing those spaces passively, which is what I opt for, because my, my name is very distinct too, by the way. So that's another factor to take into consideration. But if you're opting for the um, passive observation with a pseudonym, I would say that things to take into consideration are, you know, obviously don't post any photos, like your own photos or like photos of your actual real life settings on Telegram as a photo ID. Um, make sure to use an alternate number, so don't have your number attached. Enable two uh, two step authentication, so it prevents people trying to hack into your account because that has actually happened to me a couple of times. I got weird IP addresses trying to go into my Telegram, but because I had two FA enabled, it actually stopped that. So it was a really nice lifesaver. Uh, Would have been scary. Um, so also review your privacy settings in Telegram and make sure that they are what you want them to be. So go in and click through everything. Be very meticulous about it. Uh, and I, I guess beyond that, there are some more minute things, but I, in general, those are the the main the main uh, topics that come to mind for me for the question. Thank you. Yeah, I think it can be, you know, just uh, my own kind of observation on this is that it, uh, early career researchers can be kind of quite under a lot of pre more pressure to kind of you know prove themselves and. And actually, and the point about kind of putting yourself out there and kind of trying to promote yourself is maybe you kind of under more pressure when you've got you know um, a name to make for yourself, and and it's that's kind of it's quite a tricky one. There's no kind of real uh, definitive answer on whether you should kind of um, put yourself out there or not. But um, it's worth kind of considering all those kind of risks. Um, you know, if you you may get kind of online abuse, for example, on your own personal Twitter feed, or even if you're kind of keeping that separate from your. Um, um, uh, Michael, you've got, got some points on this. I, I just want to add to it. I, I fully agree with both Mede and, and, and you, Peter, here. Um, I mean, the, the, the personal risk is one thing and all the considerations when it comes to online uh, security. But I think also the it's very different depending on which country we operate in terms of legal frameworks. What is what is okay and what is not okay? Uh, even searching for uh, propaganda on on open web is illegal in some countries, and and using encrypted platforms and and participating in discussion is illegal in others. So I, I think it's just as a new researcher, I think there are many aspects to to consider. Um, I learned the hard way, the things I didn't consider that I just had to, to uh, go through. So I think the, the um, general advice would be to, yeah, keep, keep, keep a good check on, on privacy settings and security on the online sort of um, spaces, but also check the legal and ethical frameworks in the context that you are operating in. I, I just wanted to add that to it. Yeah. Did you want to come back, Maura? Yeah, I, I was going to build on what Michael just said and, and say also, you know, um, researchers now uh, shift jurisdictions uh, a lot. And I do think you have to be careful then also, uh, precisely going to what Michael said. So some things that are perfectly permissible in one country could get you into serious hot water uh, in, in some in some other country. Uh, and so I think, you know, if, if you're shifting unis or institutions uh, or what have you, it definitely behoves people uh, to, to find out precisely uh, what in particular the legal and broadly ethical requirements are uh, in that new jurisdiction. And just when, I, when I'm talking about sort of changing things, here's, an, here's another thing when people change. Um, Quite a lot of people were focused on jihadis and, and then began to do work uh, on the extreme right, for, for example. Uh, and I do think that actually shifting your research focus can also um, be um, pretty impactful uh, because precisely as a couple of people have said, you know, um, identity factors come into play here in quite a significant way. Uh, and for some people, I think um, jihadi activity uh, felt quite far away uh, from them. Um, and they, 
they didn't feel implicated uh, in it. But the same people, if you shift to looking at extreme right content, uh, for example, you can almost immediately feel implicated in it, you know, depending on your identity markers and whatnot. Uh, and so just because you um, have done one sort of research without having it having any kind of impact on you, I'm talking about mentally and emotionally now, it, it, do, it doesn't necessarily hold uh, across the board. Anna, you've got a comment as well? Yeah, I think I was just going to say that um, Tech Against Terrorism has published an online regulation series where we kind of shed light on different um, regulations that have to do with like um, basically extremists and terrorists, propaganda online, etc. But kind of um, giving you all the ground rules. So if you are a researcher or a journalist or, you know, uh, working at a tech company, then I advise you to have a look at those because that really tells you what is legal where. Um, and I think I was going to make another point in terms of... Um, you know, kind of universities role in this, because actually uh, I, I consider myself still relatively new as a researcher or practitioner. Um, and I graduated like two years ago. Um, and I think what universities can really work on is to also give a bit more training in terms of uh, OPSEC and uh, also mental health, because often you start studying and the idea is to, you know, to get content for on which to base your dissertation, for example, and then you start looking without the proper security mechanisms in place. Um, and then sometimes it can be like too late already uh, and you haven't protected yourself until then. So I do think that universities role should be highlighted in this as well. Um, so I think, yeah, that's why I think this discussion is so important and papers like, like Mora's is, is also like vital for this. Great, thanks everyone for that. Um, we've just got about five minutes left and we've got three questions left. So we'll probably have to leave it there. If, um, but hopefully we'll have time to get through these three questions. Um, first, I'm going to go to uh, Kieran D, who's asked, um, who's, thank you for the valuable discussions. Uh, sometimes this sector can be very exclusive. And it's difficult to feel a sense of belonging as an outsider or an up and coming stakeholder or researcher. Do you have any advice for individuals, particularly diverse individuals entering this field, uh, advice on building and belonging in inclusive networks? Who'd like to answer that? Sure, I, 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 guess, I, I guess I have a view on this, which is to say, um, uh, unfortunately, not in the past, a year or more, um, but I, I would encourage people, there are various uh, real world uh, events um, that, that are worth going to. Um, I guess I have a vested interest in, in plugging Voxpal um, events, but I do feel like our conference and our summer school and that kind of thing um, are open. Um, I, think they're, I think it's fair to say that they're welcoming uh, to, to people who are, who are working in this field. Um, and, and I guess I, 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 feel, um, I feel pretty confident saying that because uh, young researchers and others, actually, a whole diversity of people have told me that they found that a very conducive thing to do. Um, and uh, the colleagues at Swansea uh, also have a conference called TASM, uh, Terrorism and Social Media, and, and that has a very similar vibe, um, I think. So for people who are sort of on this side of the Atlantic, so in the UK and Europe, um, or who can make it over in this direction, um, I, I certainly would encourage people to maybe show up at some real world events when they're, when they're back on track. Uh, and, and I think that they could they could find that a positive experience. I hope so. Yeah, I'd echo that as well. I kept I kept a very low on, on a low profile for many years, <laughs> but when I kind of like left the BBC and started working myself, I kind of needed to do a bit more re uh, networking. I found, yeah, the Tassim conference uh, was uh, was really useful in kind of getting to know more people, and you know, very kind of open. It's not quite as uh, scary as it might seem. So ho hopefully, uh, hopefully that's that's what you'll find. Um, right, a question, uh, quite quick hopefully a quick and easy question for you uh, from Anna King. Do you know if there has been any analysis yet of the far right extremists in the USA? So there are attacks on women who occupy public health positions during COVID. So quite a specific uh, question. Uh, if anyone's aware of any analysis on that specific area. Well, there's a kind of field for research for, for you. You all, all you guys out there. So sorry about that, Anna, but we didn't come up with a, an answer there. Maybe you'll have to do some work on it. Um, hey, can I just interject? And oh, say that I do yeah. actually remember a paper um, and I went to the presentation, but I, I can't remember at the top of my mind. But if you email me or reach out to me through Twitter, then I'm sure I can dig it up. 
um because there is there was a very good paper okay anna get it get in touch with the other anna. um and then yeah we could just got about a minute or so left so um hopefully we'll be able to get some answers on this so this is from chelsea damon um we all know that many of uh the groups watch those who research them and sometimes comment about their work uh, although we want to highlight the content narratives and behavior of extremists online there have been discussions that we are also in a way promoting it by default and as a researcher sometimes struggle with this chelsea says um, not wanting to be part of the problem would love everyone's thoughts on this who wants to go first? I can, I can go first. Um, yeah, okay. I think it, um, it's something just like other things that I, I brought up in the um, uh, my presentation about how we publicly communicate, because there is always this, not just risk, but it actually happens quite a lot that, that the work we do gets um, sort of enhanced in, in uh, extremist forums and then sort of promotes their cause. Uh, so I think it's, it's a constant dilemma. I, I don't think we can get away from it. Uh, I, 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 I'm completely um, uh, convinced that that uh, working on it and talking about it does more good than bad. So I, I still think that we we uh, shouldn't let that dilemma sort of stop us. But uh, it's it's really tricky, and I think it's just a matter of. Um, combining a, a common sense with some form of strategic um, uh, thinking concerning how we, we communicate publicly. I've been I've been criticized a lot for what I show on Twitter uh, because I always show screenshots and stuff from from this, uh, and I can take that criticism and, and I can understand it. But I still think that there is an analytical value in much of it. So uh, I'm I'm all for it as long as we do it with common sense and strategy. Any other comments, finally? Yeah, I think that's certainly one area in which we could usefully have a more in-depth conversation. So um, around sort of media and knowledge communication ethics or publication and knowledge communication ethics. Um, you know, I used the word consensus earlier and some things we're not going to arrive at a consensus, but we, we could certainly agree some sort of baseline on some sort of baseline issues and then raise, you know, um, other issues and, and questions and ways forward and what have you and, and this is definitely one of the areas that i see we could usefully like really um talk about uh, in, you know in quite specific ways and, and try and figure things out and may Lee, you had a comment as well oh yeah just real quick um i th i think i've come across this too where someone you know where people talk about wanting to share certain uh, like wow check out the screenshot and um, like a way that i've seen people handle it really well is sharing the screenshot but also contextualizing what that narrative is so not just putting the extremist narrative out there by itself but providing their own academic uh, commentary around that so they shape the narrative and don't let the extremists control it brilliant Okay, well, we're, we're just two minutes over schedule now, so we better wind it up. But thanks very much to all of our panelists. Uh, had some really great discussions here and hopefully everybody's learned something. Uh, still lots of unanswered questions, uh, but then where would researchers be without unanswered questions? Um, so thanks very much, everybody. It's been a pleasure um, participating in this and uh, I'll draw this to a close now. Thank you very much, everyone.